Hi, Emma. How oh, are you? Good. How are you? So how many people here have been to an Angel City game? We're in Southern California after all. Has anyone been? OK, we've got one back there. Thank you so much. So for the, everyone who hasn't been, what is an Angel City game like right now? What's the vibe? What's the energy? Who's in the stands? I mean, I have played in a lot of different arenas and in front of a lot of fans for about a decade, and there's really nothing like an Angel City game. Um, and I think that's because everybody that comes to a game comes for more than sport. Um, they come for the community, they come for the fight for equity and progress, and they come for the belief that women from all industries can rise. And when we do, we create a better world for everybody. Mm -hmm. wow. Totally. And Kara, you, as we heard, have launched Monarch, Monarch Collective, which is investing in women's sports in a lot of ways. Can you tell us what that means? This is a $100 million fund, is that right? It is, though. We'll announce the final close tomorrow. <laughs> okay. It's come out today, but we closed fairly north of Target, which I'm excited to share. So Yes. <laughs> And how are you defining women's sports as you look at investment opportunities? Where will you be deploying this capital? Yeah, I mean, we're so um, a lot of this came out of Angel City and just sort of to set the landscape. Um, I think we defied all expectations, um, and we were fortunate enough to get Kristen as our very, very first <laughs> player as an LA native, but went from zero to 30 million in revenue in a year, selling out, really kind of changed sponsorship models, and. Um, Monarch really kind of grew out of just recognizing that it does take purpose and it takes kind of building a community in the cap table or in the investor group in the C-suite, but it also is a moment in time where you just show up and you do the work and what we're doing is investing in teams, leagues and rights and in particular in the sports where media revenue is growing like this. And the crazy thing is what got me into this was actually trying to get Kristen paid. Um, so I got involved in the pay equity fight with the U.S. Women's National Team. And so like the cost of running a team from a salary standpoint is crazy low. And the revenues have also been crazy low. But to build a sustainable kind of business, which is what I hope we do in women's sports, they both kind of have to grow together. So we're excited about soccer, basketball, golf, tennis, racing, et cetera, but more focused on sports that people want to watch on streaming platforms and broadcast. Yeah, let's talk about like kind of the opportunity here. I think last time we talked about this, you identified this gulf between like, for instance, how easy or not easy it is to watch a women's sports game on TV and then how many followers these players have on social media demonstrating interest in other channels. Can you kind of describe that gulf and what the opportunity is? Yeah, I mean, if Instagram didn't exist, Angel City wouldn't exist. I, I was a fan in the audience with like Kristen, Pre trying to find Kristen Press jersey with my, my kids, went to nine stores, couldn't find it, couldn't find content, but what I could find was Instagram. And a bunch of people told me I was crazy that I wanted to watch women's soccer more than every four years, but I could follow Kristen and all of the incredible players on the national team. And so, I mean, social media was the first distribution channel. And as I like to say, women have twice as many words as men. They're kind of fun to follow on social media. There's some great lifestyle content. <laughs> No, totally. And Kristen, how has this explosion of interest in the past few years, you know, changed your experience, your career, your life as a player? You know, what is different now compared to looking back five years ago? I think the thing for me that is most powerful is that, you know, I spent my career fighting for betterment, fighting for pay equity, fighting for basic resources for athletes that just weren't there. And now when we get a young player, I have an 18-year-old teammate in Angel City, and her first experience is professional, she has fans, she has a life that can sustain her. And so the goal that we had this with a whole fight for equal pay with the U.S. Women's National Team and now the NWSL following that, um, the goal is that the next generation doesn't have to fight. They don't have to spend their entire career doing two jobs. Um, but what's really unique is out of my generation of player, we're actually quite entrepreneurial. So many of us have started our own business because we see the value in women's sports. We see the value in what we're doing. Um, and so it, it's a really cool generation of player that came together to fight for more. Um, and now we're, we're gonna continue in the next chapters of our lives to continue to improve and fight for progress and equity. Yeah, what is that unique insight that players have into the business opportunity here? What do they know that others might not realize? The giant gap that exists between the demand for women's sports and the delivery of it. I mean, I can't find my own team play. 
Like I, you know, I'm injured right now and when the team's away, I, it takes me 10 minutes trying to find the content for my own team. And so it's like, how many people does that deter? Um, and so I think that's where the investment comes in. And that's where the belief that this isn't a charity. We don't, we're far past the time that we want people to come in and they say, oh, I'm doing this for my daughter. Like we want people to come in like Kara because they see the business opportunity, because they see the potential that we have in women's sports to not just change sport, but to change the world in a really positive way. Totally. Um, I'll come to everyone for questions in a moment, so if you have any, start thinking. But um, Kara, you know, why now? Why is this the moment where women's sports seems to be gaining this momentum in business? You know, for me personally, I mean, I'd spent my entire career in tech and media. And if you told me I was going to quit the job that I love to go start a women's sports fund five years ago, I don't know if I would have believed you. And yet I feel so fortunate that I found this at this moment in time. And it is the first place in my life where building representation into coalitions, into cap tables, into C-suites, where the people we hire actually care that we walk on the field, right? The players, I think, care. If you look at our team, I mean, we're not perfect, and we have to create room for imperfection, but if you look at our team on and off the field and our community in the stands, it is a modern consumer community, and it is like the country club none of us ever had. And so the why now is just sort of the, it's the first place in my life where I've seen that uh, diversity drive enterprise value and drive revenue streams. So we have generated at Angel City north of $50 million in sponsorship revenue. We have more revenue than the lowest tier of the men's MLS teams without media revenue coming in. <laughs> But we did it with a new kind of impact sponsorship model. So we take 10% of every sponsor contract and we put it into the community. So with DoorDash, for example, we will have put over a million dollars into delivering food to food insecure parts of LA. Well, what does that do? It, we do that with our community and it actually has brought in many new sponsors. So it's not just beer and cars and banks, and we love our beer and cars and banks. <laughs> <laughs> but we have supplements and female alcohol and fashion. And so it's a moment in time where you can actually, I mean, I'll talk like an investor for a second, because you can, there's literally an arbitrage on sexism right now. But also, you, people, you can tell if people are just showing up to make the money or because they have an arena that they want to utilize versus they actually believe that they can put butts in seats and, you know, and, and, and fill an arena or fill a stadium to watch the best players in the world who aren't small men but are virtuosos in a complete completely different way. And so I guess I was working on my side project at two in the morning for too long. I had my Jerry Maguire moment in a cathedral and I said, I am building the wrong cathedral. It is time to build a different one. Amazing. <laughs> well, does anyone have any questions for Kara and Kristen? If you do, you can raise your hand. Okay, well, we'll keep going. Um, you know, Kristen, the World Cup finished a few weeks ago and um, I'm sure many people saw the incident in which the Spanish Soccer Federation leader kissed a player without her consent and ended up in a huge controversy in Spain and internationally. You know, when you have, are having this kind of conversation about how much potential there is and how much opportunity we see and how much more respect women's sports is getting, then at the same time something like that is happening on the biggest world stage in sports, you know, what does that feel like for you as a player to see that dichotomy? Yeah, I think the, the thing that I take away from this is we've made so much progress and there's so much more progress that needs to be made. Um, and so we can't let our foot, we can't take our foot off the gas. Um, and I think in the NWSL we experienced a ton of toxicity, um, a ton of abuse, and as players and with teams and ownership and the league, we really have come together and try to eradicate that behavior in the best way that we can. Um, but I think that the, the it's a silencing mechanism in so many ways um, that we've been told again and again that if we speak up, if we speak out, oh, the league, you know, the league won't sustain it. We, it you can't say anything because, you know, what are the consequences? Um, and so I think we're beyond those silencing mecha mechanisms now, and we have the strength and the autonomy to speak out and, and make our environment safer and, and hopefully inspire everyone across industries to continue to speak out a type, uh, against these types of injustices. Mm -hmm. And I would just say, like, Kristen's a cultural icon because she couldn't afford not to care about her work environment. It wasn't 
a choice for you to care, right? And so, I mean, it's very, it's kind of amazing if you look at the women, the, the athletes who come into women's sports, highly educated, you know, forced to be activists in their own way, very purposeful, doing it for the love of the game, and twice as many words, right? And so, um, I mean, it's, uh, and I think in Spain it's really opened, it, it's just an example of like the world paid more attention to, to soccer or football than they would have otherwise. Um, and then I paid more attention to Spanish policy than otherwise. Like they're more progressive in some ways than the United States. And so I think it's an amazing way that sport has become culture and kind of wakes us up to how all these dynamics come together and makes us more of a global community that can care about global topics. Definitely, thank you. Um, you know, also at the World Cup, the U.S. women's national team ended up getting knocked out of competition pretty early. You know, at this moment when there's so much momentum and there's been so much attention on the U.S. women's national team, you know, is that, does that um, end up being a setback? Is that a challenge more than it might be otherwise when at this phase of development when there's so much momentum and things are still pretty nascent in the grand scheme of things? Before this World Cup, a reporter asked me if it would be good for the world if the U.S. lost. Because for the last two World Cups, we were able to use the World Cup to create massive change and fight for equal pay um, and find a settlement and agree to equal pay moving forward. Um, and so a, a lot of other countries were just having their beginnings of fights with their federations for pay, for resources. Um, and so when I got asked that, of course, I was like, no, like, we'll just <laughs> keep leading the way and keep inspiring. And also, you always have to like, be blindly foolish and thinking you can win. Um, and then after we lost, it was a really interesting series of events where I did understand the merit of other world powers stepping up. Um, both in England and in Spain, uh, the two finalists, they're having massive fights with their federations about basic rights. Um, and so I think we hope as the US Women's National Team that our fight was able to inspire the fight. And I, and I always think about um, walking towards equal equality with a torch in my hand. And when I joined the US Women's National Team, I was handed a tor torch because there was a whole other decade, a generation of players that had already been fighting. And when you know, I continue to carry that torch as far as, and high as I can, um, and you know, it, in one way, I thought my job was to pass it to the next generation. But in a lot of ways, I think that over the last 10 years, we were able to you know, light a little fire and let it spread out and let other countries model after what we did, let other people in other industries start to stand up and fight. And I think that's a lot more powerful um, than a single torch that you can continue to hand down. That's amazing. Beautiful. So who do you both want oh. <laughs> you know, so who do you both want to reach right now? Who should be watching? Who should be sponsoring? Who should be investing in women's sports and in women's soccer? Do you want to go first? Yeah, go for it. I mean, first I'd say everyone in the audience can play a role. Right? If you're in another industry, it doesn't matter what it is, you can come in. Nonprofit, media, tech, it, it doesn't matter. Everyone probably can figure out how to play a small role as an investor, as a sponsor. I think what I would just say is get really curious. Um, follow players. You, like That's what connects you, I think, to, to the sport. And then what I say is when I show up in a stadium or an arena, I feel sometimes like the Forrest Gump of women's soccer. I, I just show up <laughs> in the right place at the right time. I feel 12 again. And how often do we get to feel 12 again? Just go feel 12 again. and and. You know, if someone told me that I was going to start a professional women's sports team, you know, I didn't think women in their 40s were sports team owners. So to me, it's convinced me that anything is possible. And a lot of people told me it was not possible. So I kind of now just think, think something is possible. Make a new friend, show up, go to a game, enjoy yourself. Definitely sponsor and just buy a ticket. <laughs> buy a ticket. There's some finals going on at the W right now. Buy a ticket. <laughs> Awesome. Well, hopefully we'll have some more people raising their hands next time when they've been to an Angel City game. Um, thank you both so much. Thank you, Emma. Thank you.